and now that we're kind of up and rolling, that's why we're actually coming out to the classes right now and speaking with the, with the professors to get their inf to get their permission to come speak with you and let you guys know that we do have a club available. And if you guys are just looking for some place air conditioned to hang on and do your homework, and where it's relatively quiet unless Nate and George are arguing about physics or something, but it's... Taps it's, versus space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Taps versus space and, um, oh my God, encapsulation versus <laughs> obstruction. and Very deep conversations and debates and arguments sometimes, but it's, it's a very cool place to hang out. I mean, I, I've been here in, in California for four years, five years. I still can't get adjusted to this change in weather where it's so hot and then so cold. It's it's so it's so awesome to be able to go into that computer club room and just sit there where it's a controlled climate like this and just work on homework. Hear these guys arguing behind me like, okay, well, what are they talking about? Okay, well, that makes sense. Well, no, I don't agree with that or whatever the case is. So it's it's a very cool place to hang out. So I just wanted to come by and let you guys know that we do have it available. And if you guys are interested, feel free to pop in Monday through Thursday, um, 11 to 1, Monday, Wednesday, 12 to 3, Tuesday, Thursday. And if you have any questions now, you let me know. If you come up with something later, let TAC know, and he and I will be in contact. And thanks for your time. Sorry to take up so much of your time. Yes? Is there a sign up or just show up? Just show up. I mean, at this point, we're just trying to get bodies in there. Um, right now, the people that do show up are regulars. So we do our own thing. There's nothing really formalized right in there. But as more people start showing up and becoming regulars, it's like, okay, we'll start having a list of, of events that are coming up. Like, okay, today is the 7th. On the 21st, TAC is gonna come in and talk about um, programming for whatever. Gotcha. You know, or you know, so-and-so is able to bring in a speaker from uh, Netgear or whatever talk about networking and stuff like that so as the club continues to grow and become more formalized then we'll start having a calendar of events and they'll be posted on the wall and we'll get your contact information and we'll be able to let you know directly anything else all right guys thanks again for letting me take up so much of your class time i appreciate it sorry tech no problem thank you very much mm -hmm. sure. we'll see you later yep all right yep from last Wednesday we talked about variables of different kinds we talked about you know the usual global variables where when your app is up and running they can help maintain you know information but once your app closes you know all that is going to go away we talked about the tiny DB which is a local file you know that you keep on your Android device and it keeps track of you know the uh, um, information that you want to save so you can kind of look at TinyDB as a way to store variables but it's not volatile meaning that you know the value of the variables do retain over reset of your app reset of the phone itself not not wiping okay if you wipe your phone that's going to be gone but if you just see you a know, power down and power up the phone you know it can be available again so are there any questions about that before we move on No questions about that? Yep. Can you store images? Like you can images. store images. Okay, so the question about storing images is this. Okay. So let's go ahead and talk about how to store images. So I'm going to start a new project here. Okay. Um, click new start project. And I'm just going to call it camera. Okay. Because that's what it's going to do. It's a very simple camera application where you can take pictures. So when you have a camera application and you want to store images, you go to um, under media, you can see there's a camera component here. And this is what you need is to take a look at the description. To people in the back, you know, this it may not be easy to read it. A camera is a component to take a picture using the device's camera. After the picture is taken, the name of the file on the phone containing the picture is available as an argument to the after picture event. The file name can be used 
for example, to set the picture property of an image component. So that is the extent of control that you have when you use the built-in camera to take pictures. So the answer is yes, you can store pictures. Um, you can download stuff from the web and store the images as well, and it will give you a path to where it is stored or, and also the file name. Does that answer your question, or are you planning to do something different? Um, as like in TinyDB, like No, you cannot store a picture in TinyDB. It's too big for TinyDB. But you can store it using some other means, you know, and be able to retrieve. So what you can do is to store the image as a file itself, and then store the name of the file in TinyDB. Does that make yeah. any sense? Okay. Question? No. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, so the next question is, what kind of value can we store in variables? Okay, can we store in variables? Can we, what kind of value can we store in TinyDB, which relates to your question, okay? So you might say, well, haven't we really explored all of that already? We can store numbers, we can store text. In other words, you can ask someone for the name or the address, and we can store that you know, as text as well, in variables as well as in TinyDB. But App Inventor has one really awesome type that most people overlook for one thing, and two, you know, they don't know how to utilize. It's called a list, okay, L-I-S-T, a list. <coughs> so what we'll do today is kind of focus on that one, and we'll basically say, okay, so what is a list, what can we do with a list, and why is it important, okay? <coughs> and we'll talk about, so that th these are all under variables. I changed the ordering just a little bit because you know this is what, where we were at last I mean uh, last Wednesday, so I'm starting with this you know, uh, topic here. So in here we have I wrote one slide on lists, um, but what I can also do is just to do a demonstration in class, just so they can see what a list is. Okay, so let me switch back to <coughs> the course material in here and also just use an example to illustrate it. So let me close this, I don't need that. I'm just closing the stuff that I don't need. <coughs> All right. There are times when individual variables are useful, and then there are times when things in individual variables are related in a way, okay? So just like when you write, when you use a form, Okay, you have your first name, last name, and middle name. Now those are all separate pieces. Okay, if you want to design a form to enter all that information in App Inventor, then you will have three text boxes, right? One text box for the given name or the first name, one box for the middle initial, and then one box for the last name or family name. Does, does that make any sense? Okay. So even though you have three pieces of information, they are related because they are all components of, quote unquote, the name of the person. Does that make any sense? So there are cases or there are times when we want to treat the entire thing as one single thing, and then there are times we just want to use the last name or the first name um, from that name. So a list is really useful because it is a way for you to combine all those components into one single thing and yet you have a way to easily separate the individual components and say, oh, this time I just need the first name, hey, here's the first name. But this time I want the entire thing, okay, here's the entire name with first name, last name, and initial. Yep? Does it treat that like an object? Um, more or less. <laughs> more or less. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at lists today because I feel this is a very useful and versatile type that most people do not you know, they, they underutilize you know, this kind of, uh, of item. All right, so without you know, going, you know, waiting anymore, we're gonna you know, play with lists a little bit here, and I'm gonna do exactly the same thing that I said I would do a little bit earlier, and I would also use layout, you know, just to remind you guys you know, what layouts are and how to utilize layouts. So I'm gonna use a table layout here to enter a name with the first name, last name, and middle initial. So in this case, I would need three rows because I have three components. And then each component is going to be a text label to indicate what it is for. So 
gonna pull three labels here, I'll change the text of the labels. And then I'll also have three text boxes for the actual entries. So we'll have, you can't see it, nope, oh, right place. Second one goes here, and third one goes here. Okay, there we go. So now I'm gonna change the text of the text boxes. So the first name is this one, okay, first name. And then this is gonna be the middle initial. And this is going to be the last name. So, last name. Like so, um, are there any questions about this form at this point? Okay, no questions. <clears throat> and I have three text boxes. Um, because I need to refer to the text boxes, having these names as text box one, two, and three is not particularly helpful. So I would at least rename the text boxes. So the first text box will be text box first name, FN. And this one is going to be middle initial. So I just use MI as a suffix here. And this is going to be the last name. So I'll use LN to indicate this is the last name. Okay? This is just for convenience, okay? Because when you write programs and you do not name the components or your variables appropriately, sometimes it becomes really hard to distinguish but which one is which? Then you have to switch back to this screen, then go back to the other screen. It's just a lot of trouble. But if you name your components properly, then it's a lot easier to, to pick them out in the box screen. Okay. So this app doesn't really do a single thing at this point. Okay, it just has three text boxes. So what we want to do is to say, okay, I want to be able to store a name into TinyDB as one single entry. Okay? as one single entry in TinyDB, but that one single entry is a list. Okay, So now I need a button to store. Okay, so I'm going to drag a button here and change the text of the button and say this is um, just to store you know, the name into the TinyDB and change the name of the button itself just so that I know what the button is for in case I need some additional buttons. All right, so let's go ahead and specify the blocks. So here comes the blocks, and once again, it is really helpful because I can look at the, com the name of the components and be able to tell what it is. So I want the click of the button to trigger the following operation. I want to store a single thing into the TinyDB that, is actually, that actually has three components. It's got the first name, middle initial, and last name but it only occupies one spot in the tiny DB, okay? So the way to do this, oh, I forgot one thing, because I did not put in a tiny DB component into the application, so I need to go to storage here, pick out a tiny DB and drop it in. Then I can now go back to blocks and make use of tiny DB. So you go to tiny DB and we want to store a value, and the tag is just the name of the thing that you are storing. You can give it any name as long as it is consistent when you retrieve it. Okay. So I just call this name because it has all three components. It has got the first name, middle initial, and the last name, but it's a single entry in the database. And then the, the value to store is going to be the tricky part because I cannot just pick out the text of the first name or the text of the middle name or the text of the last name. I have to make a composite you know, thing out of all three components and you can say, but we can concatenate strings. Yes, we can. Okay? String concatenate, concatenation is called join, J-O-I-N, and it's pretty easy to do. But the problem with joining is it's hard to split. Okay? Once you join the first name, middle initial, and the last name, and you want to separate those things back out again, it's really hard. Okay? Not impossible, okay? but it is hard. So what we want to do is to make use of the concept of a list. So we go to lists here and say, okay, what can we do with these lists? Well, we can make a list, okay? The other ones are kind of complicated. We'll get to those later on. So we'll go ahead and make a list and store the result of, you know, the, the, we'll store the list into TinyDB. There are three components, so you click this little United Nations symbol here to add one more item into the list that we are creating. The three components of this list is, go is going to be the first name, middle initial, and the last name. So now I can go to the first name text box here, 
and just pick out the text property put it here and I'm just going to be lazy here and duplicate this a few times because I can change the text of which text box using the drop-down box like this okay. all right so with this little block here I am you know, saying that okay whenever the button is clicked I am going to store something into you know, the tiny DB the name of that thing is just name NAME okay you want to you know, specify something better, you can say full name or something like that. And it's going to be a list consisting of three components. It's going to be consisting of the first name, the middle name, and the last name. And that's all I'm going to do. Okay? This is all that I'm going to do. <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and run this program in, well, let me think. In, I'm, I'm debating whether to run this in the emulator or running in the phone itself. I think I'll run this in an emulator but without connection to App Inventor because I want to be able to show you guys what, how things are actually stored internally. You know, when you store something into TinyDB, how is that stored? Well, it actually creates a file and the file has, uh, it's an XML file and then inside the XML file is a certain representation to store you know, different types of items. So I want to show you kind of look the, the, the details because some of you may find it actually useful later on when you debug your application. Okay, so we're gonna do this here and start up the virtual machine but without any connection to um, App Inventor. So I'm already here, so I just need to run uh, emulator. So the emulator is gonna run but has no connectivity whatsoever to App Inventor in this case. So I will have to run my commands to install apps and stuff like that. So I'm going to wait until the emulator is up. It's completely up. That's good. So I will start up another command line Oops, not this one. over here. And I'm going to start up ADB. And the first thing I would do is to check devices just to make sure that the emulator is connected to ADB, and it is. And then the next thing I will do is to go back to the App Inventor here, build an APK file because I don't want the connection here. I just want to build an APK file. I cannot do the QR code anymore because the emulator does not have a camera to take a look at the QR code. So I have no choice but to save the APK file to the local <coughs> computer. <clears throat> the name of the file is going to be after the name of the app itself. And any time now. There we go. So it's going to save the app as camera.apk. So this is a file that is ready to be installed. I'm just going to save the file into the downloads folder, switch back to the command line interface, and then run adb install dash r. Remember the dash r stands for reinstalling if it is already installed. And it's going to be in my downloads folder. It's called, well, really should not be called camera anymore, but it is at this point. So I'm going to install it like here. Um, press the enter key, it's going to install the app. And it will complain one little thing at the end. It will complain RM fail for dash F, you know, but that's okay. And then we, sw we switch back here and look for camera, which is right here. Start up the app. It gives us you know, the three text boxes. So I'm going to type here. Uh, I cannot type on the keyboard. I have to actually type on the virtual keyboard and not the actual keyboard. So no last name, no, no middle initial, and then last name is A U Y E U N G. There you go. And then we click store. And obviously nothing happens or nothing visible is happening because, none, because we did not specify what to do with these values. We just say, okay, store in the tiny DB and that's the end of it. So nothing is we, we cannot see any type of processing um, visually. But the, p the point is, 
where is it stored, and how it is stored. Okay, so let's go ahead and go get into that part. So the first thing I need to do is to run ADB again. Okay, but this time when I run ADB, I'm going to run it in a special way. So I'm, I just run ADB by itself to look up the options because I can never remember all the options for the ones that I need. So I just need to go through this and I think it's just shell, okay, right here. So when you look at this entry here, it says you know, ADB shell is going to run a remote shell interactively. Which basically means you, know, you are now, you know, once I do this, you will have a command prompt just like with a Linux command prompt. It is a Linux command prompt running on the Android device itself, okay? So you can use ls, you can use cd, and all the other commands that you already know that will work in any type of Unix slash Linux-like operating system. Okay, so this is what I'll do. So I'm gonna say dot slash adb, and then shell. And you know, it doesn't really do much, it just gives you a command prompt of a pound sign here, but that's your command line, okay? So you say ls, it shows you all the folders, so we need to dig into um, the location where that file is located, okay? Um, you don't have to learn this part, you know, but as a part of this class, I want to let you guys know how to navigate inside the Android operating system using the command line because sometimes it is very, very useful, okay? There are certain things you can do here, but not in the user, uh, graphical user interface. What, well, lots of things, yep? Is there a way to get to this on your phone? Or? Yes. ADB can connect to a phone by USB cable, uh, Wi-Fi, and I think Bluetooth is capable as well. But you have to turn on the developer options to let it happen. Okay, so ADB is not on the phone itself, it actually has to run the computer. Right, ADB um, is what you run on the PC, okay. but there's a piece that matches the ADB on the phone, so every Android phone is ready to talk to ADB. Okay. You just have to configure the uh, developer options to allow that. Yeah, Is it because ADB in the developer option? Um, I don't remember the exact name, but it's under developer option. So let me let me look it up. Here's my phone. And I can show you guys, you know, also here. Uh, this is the one where you have to press the uh, about phone six times in order to get the developer options to show right. up, is that correct? Yeah, but once you have the developer options show up, there are things inside that you can configure, like you know how you want ADB to be able to connect to your phone. So I need to, I need to experiment with it to, fi to, to remember how to set it up. So let me get rid of the uh, LED first. Settings. Oh, I can make it go a little bit lower. Out of focus. Okay. So you basically go all the way down. You know, once you have developer option turned on, is this one over here? And under developer option, you scroll down. Um, there's also root access <coughs> apps and ADB, but you don't need a phone to be uh, rooted to use ADB. So under debugging here, you have to enable it. I'm not sure whether you guys can read it or not. Let me try to uh, zoom in a little bit more. Okay. I know it's kind of fuzzy because it's a low light kind of situation, but it, it shows well enough, okay? So under debugging, there's uh, Android debugging, which is just an on-off switch to enable or disable the ADB interface. If you turn this off, then you won't be able to connect regardless of how you want to connect. So assuming you have it enabled, then you can scroll down a little bit more and you can, you can select one of these two. So you can either connect by network, which is really handy because you, you can just do it by Wi-Fi. So there's no actual physical connection between the PC and the Android device that you are debugging. <clears throat> I have it turned off you know, for security. You probably want to turn off, but if you know that, okay, you know, I know exactly which PC is going to do this, you can turn it on. Um, 
uh, you can also revoke uh, USB debug authorization, which is this item here. So every time you connect your phone by USB cable to your PC, your phone would actually pop up a, a box, you know, a little notification symbol, and you can you can slide it down, and it will give you options of how you want the device to look like from the end of the PC. So at that time, you can say, okay, do I want to enable um, ADB connection through USB? Okay, and if you do, I think you have to kind of click on the device itself to allow that to happen. In other words, you know, people cannot just you know randomly hook up their computer to your phone and quote unquote debug your phone. <laughs> so there are several layers of security um, already on the device itself. Um, oh, this is the next one, local terminal. Enable terminal app that offers local shell access. So you can basically install your know, terminal apps to open up a shell on the device itself. Okay? That's now, it's a separate app I guess, that we have to install. And that just allows those apps to work, right? It's Correct. It's a shell app that you're putting on, and right. enable this, and then maybe do one of those apps. Yeah, so you can, you can open the shell you know, using at least two ways. You can open it locally on the device itself if you install a terminal app and have this enabled. You can also use ADB to open the shell remotely on a PC with a regular PC keyboard. And that's the way I prefer, because I like to keep, you know, type on a regular keyboard. But if you're on your own and you just need to check a few things, so you don't have a PC to hook up, then you can use an app to open the shell. Then you can use all the same commands. Okay. Is that okay? Sort of. If you don't understand this part, that's okay. It's not really you know a, a, a crucial part to the class, but I think it is going to be helpful to people who want to go a little bit deeper into how um, apps work on an Android device. Okay, so I'm gonna turn off the phone here and switch back to uh, my command line. And of course I cannot remember which one I'm using. It's this one, okay. So there are several commands that are really useful because in this case, because the, uh, the, the shell itself doesn't have a fancy prompt to tell you where you are, like on a regular system. So if you need to know where you are, there's a command called PWD, which stands for Print Working Directory, okay? And PWD will tell you where you are in the file system. And in, in, at this point, a single slash means you're at the top part of the file system. It's also called the root directory, okay? So now that we're on, at the root directory, these are basically all subdirectories. And can you guys guess you know, which one may contain the file that is responding, uh, corresponding to TinyDB. Data. Yeah, my first guess would be data. Okay, so let's go ahead and check out data. So I can use you, you can use CD and change directory to to data, and then do an LS again to list the content inside data. So this is all the stuff inside data. Okay, miscellaneous, local, app private, backup property. Don't panic. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> when people see the name, the folder called Don't Panic, you know, the first thing is panic. to panic, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we have app, we have downlink, cache, we have data, we have system, lost and found. Okay. So which one do you want to explore? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's one thing you can do instead of CD and going into the folder, you can do an LS right here without CD first. Okay. So we'll, we'll do LS on local. Uh, doesn't look very promising. So under local, there's only one subfolder called TMP or temporary. Okay, doesn't look very promising to me. So we want to check out app two, okay, LS app. And we see some kind of interesting thing. Okay, one of these things is uh, camera one, right? Look at the first item. It's app inverter.ai, my you know, ID. Uh, and then dot camera dash one dot apk. In other words, when you upload an apk file to install, this is where it's uploaded to. But nonetheless, this is just the apk file or the app, the uh, the packaged file itself. It is not a folder, okay? And it's not going to be helpful because this is not going to contain the file that contains the tiny db entries. So the next one is going to be data. So we say ls data. Ah, okay, we're looking at something that might be interesting here. 
because we see you know app inventor dot ai uh, underscore my id dot counter something that we did last week remember the counter thing okay and if you scroll up okay this is in i think in a reverse chronological order i'm looking for the the app that i wrote today what folder are you in now? in data it's in data data Okay, so PWD, um, if I go to data one more time, oops, dev, data, there we go. PWD, LS, this is where we are at at this point. <coughs> Pretty sure I clicked that button, so am I missing something? <coughs> did I run the app itself? Yes, I did run the app. I is clicked it, store. Is it going to be an XML extension? Yeah, it's going to have an XML extension, but I don't see the uh, I don't see the folder itself. Oh, okay. So that's why I'm a little bit puzzled here. Well, we can do this. Well, it does exist, so I need to use a different option here. Oh, it doesn't like that option. It's not a full LS. Hmm. Okay, I guess it, we just have to visually go through it. Does that belong this name? It should have this kind of name, but I'm not seeing it. Oh, it's the first entry. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's that's usually the case. You know, I cannot find it, and then. Oh yeah, it's right in front of you. Okay, so it's the first entry is app inventor dot AI underscore W zero 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 six eight eight seven dot camera. Okay. Well I'm not I cannot possibly remember that. So I'm gonna cheat a little bit here. Copy C D and then paste. There we go. So now we're in a folder that is specific to this particular app. Okay? So we are getting close. We're getting really close to what we are looking for. So inside this folder, we do another LS, and we can see there are four subfolders. The you know, one folder is called uh, shared prefs or preferences. Uh, one is called code cache, files, or lib library. Okay, and in this case, we can just go ahead and look at every single one because there are only four. And there we go. It's under shared preferences. Okay, so now we CD one more time. Okay, shared preferences, PWD to show the full path. So this is this is useful, okay? If you have to take like a picture or remember one thing out of this discussion, the first part of this class, this is where you this is where you will find you know, all the files created by your app that is stored locally. Okay? It's under data data, app inventor.ai underscore whatever login name you choose to use for your app development, dot and then the actual name of the app itself. Okay? And then you have to do a slash again, shared preferences. So within here, we have a tinydb1.xml file, which probably tells you about you know, what it's for, right? So we use a cat command to say to look at the content of tinydb1, tinydb1.xml, and this is it. Okay, this is the content. Let me highlight the actual content of this file. This is the actual content of the file. It's an XML file. XML stands for extensible uh, markup language, okay, which means it is really just a container language to contain any type of data. And you can see that it is a map, okay, because you can see the open tag map here and then the closed you know, tag for that element. And inside map, each item is stored as a string because you can see the name of the string begins here. This is marking the end of the string. The actual content of the string is this part here. So we'll take a look at this part here and go like, whoa, that's a, that's a little bit of a gibberish, okay? So what can we do about this gibberish here? Well, it's using uh, typical HTML encoding, okay? Which means Empress N Q U O T semicolon is just how it's spelled, it just how it specifies a single quote symbol, okay? So we basically look at these characters, one, two, three, four, five, six. So these six basically just specifies a single quote. That's all it does, okay? 
So we have single quote, tag, single quote again. And then followed by a comma, single quote, single quote, because I did not specify a middle name. Okay, so it's an empty string. That's why it's a single quote followed by another single quote, another comma. So the comma is separating items in a list. And then each item in the list, in this case, is double quoted. I mean, single quote, sorry. This is my last name. Once again, we have a single quote, my last name, and another single quote. And what is also important in this case, there are two things. One is the use of a square bracket. See this pair of square, square bracket here? When you see a pair of square brackets, it is a list. If you don't see a square bracket, it is just a regular string. Okay, it has no particular meaning. But when you see square brackets, it means it is enclosing items inside a list. Yep. I noticed that it doesn't have like a key value relationship that most. It does. It is. This is the key. That's the value. So, okay. So the the. The ordering of mm -hmm. those three in the list, those three items within the list, that doesn't change. So if they're in that first position, then it's always going to be the text that came from text one. Because text first. because how I order items in the list. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I got now it. later on we are going to go to key value pairs, but I don't want to make it, okay. make it any more confusing yeah. than it needs to be initially. So that's why. So okay. but I understand your question. <coughs> okay. Yep. Yeah. All right, so do we have any questions about this part, you know, how a list of three items is stored in this case? So once again, if you take out all the HTML encoding, it really is just an open square bracket, quote, my first name, a comma, so the comma is used as a separator between items in the list, quote, quote, okay, this is not a double quote, it is a pair of single quotes, because I did not specify a middle name. And then we have A-U-Y-E-U-N-G as my last name, and then the quote, and then the closed square bracket to indicate that this is the end of this particular list. Are we doing okay so far? Yep, go ahead. We had used numbers with still have quotes with variables. That's a very good question. If you use numbers, you would not have quotes. But the, the use of numbers is tricky because in App Inventor, like any scripting language, you can treat a number as a string, and you can treat it as a numerical value. It all depends on what you're doing with it. If you use the numerical comparison, it is treated as a, as a numerical value, but when you use the text comparison, then it will be compared as text. So that's why it's kind of uh, elastic, <laughs> because it doesn't really determine what it is until you, you tell it what you're doing with it. Then it will say, oh, since you're doing this with this thing, I'm going to treat it as a string, or I'll treat it as a, as a numerical value. That's a good question. Yep? The question, what's the, about semicolon? Why is the... The semicolon is a part of the quote. Yeah, but in other words, you know, this single quote here mm -hmm. cannot exist inside an XML file, because in the XML you know, documentation, a single quote you know, cannot uh, appear unless it is in this context. So the content of whatever you're encoding cannot have a single quote. So that's why a single quote is represented as ampersand, Q, U, O, T, and a semicolon. So oh. these six characters together means a single quote. Okay. Any other questions? Has anyone seen this type of format before? You mean just XML? In XML is one, okay, so there are two standards involved in this file. The first standard that is involved is XML, which is extensible markup language. The second one is something that you probably would not be exposed to unless you program in JavaScript or server-side you know, scripting. It's called JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation, or JSON in short, okay? So JSON is what this part is. If it starts with a square bracket, it is a list. If it starts with a single quote, it is a string. If it's in, in numerical, it's just the digits, okay? And it can also represent a few other things too. So JSON is really flexible in terms of what it can represent. Yep? Where it says string name equals name, is that what you put in tag? tag name that is correct. Name? Whatever is inside the double quotes, which in this case is confusing because it's also name, but that is just what I choose to be the name of the tag. 
So if I choose full name, then whatever is inside the double quote is going to be full. So this is how information is tracked inside a tiny DB. It's nothing more than a flat text file. And that's why if you want to store an image, it's, it's got to be huge because it will want to encode everything in printable characters. Yep. So knowing where that's at, <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, and if I built out functions or buttons to interact with it, uh, would I be able to just uh, like essentially put in a file that yes. has a whole bunch? Yes. You can inject content uh, into without it. Without having to do it all on the app inventor side. You can package certain things too. You can package regular text files you know, in your app. So I think there are ways for you to have a, like an initial you know, tiny DB file. So there are ways to make it happen. Okay. Yep. And, and instead of actually having like string values like that, can you, in your list, can you hold locations? And how would you re represent the location? Uh, by directory location. Yeah, the path, the normal path. Well, a path is a string. Yeah. Okay. okay. It just slashes. starts with slash. Special. Oh, that's cool. Um, you can do the encoding. It will automatically put in whatever encoding is necessary. Okay. Okay. And when you retrieve anything f back from TinyDB, it is automatically decoded okay. to the original string. So you don't have to worry about all this encoding and decoding. It's all done automatically by App Inventor. Okay. But I do want to show you this because you know you might want to be able to track this down, okay? Especially when you're debugging your app, okay? You say, okay, did I store the value? Did I store it correctly? Well, this tells you exactly how it is stored. Yep. If, if you then uh, want to assess only your surname, for example, mm -hmm. then uh, inside it, uh, it just uh, uses it as a small array, or. You can look at a list as an array if you want yeah. to use that so terminology. It, so it, it can retrieve then oh, yeah. only your surname oh, yeah. and it's easy only. Yeah. Absolutely. But because here if we don't see, you know, like what, first, second, third. Uh, well, the ordering is implicit. In other words, you know, when you look at this, just look at the comma because the comma is used to separate yeah. items. Yeah. So that makes you know, this one the first item which interestingly has an index of 1 and not 0. Okay, so you don't see, right? It is Here. not like C. Yes. Okay, in C and C++ and anything that's C derived, the first item has an index of 0, but this one has an index of 1. So we start counting from 1, which I don't really necessarily like because it's not consistent with most other programming languages, but that's how it's set up and go like, okay, it's off by 1, you know, it's no big deal. Is that yep. App Inventor or Android? It is App Inventor. Okay. Yep. Android has Android is Java based, so it is sure. actually using the C standard. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Well, if I can get to this file using this method, can I edit this file and change the content? Well, the answer is yes. It's nothing more than a regular text file. If you want to inject changes, not through App Inventor. And through a, you know, like another editor or copy a file from your PC to here, you can do that. It's just a file. Nothing special about this file at all other than App Inventor makes use of this file. Are we doing okay? Yep, go ahead. Uh, can you do it? Hmm? Can you do it right now? Um, I can do it, but it won't show anything because my app doesn't retrieve anything. That's okay. I just want to see it. Okay. Well, let me see which editor is included in the shell. So vi, no, nano, nano, no, no ed, touch. no, huh? Touch. Touch. Touch is, no. <laughs> no, Vim. Vim. no, Vim is really big compared to vi, you know, Vim is bigger. Pico, no. Ah, I give up. <laughs> I'm going to ask. <laughs> Built in. Android text editor. Um, and there we go. Console text editor. Install basic box. Okay. Nano can be compiled. Okay, so nothing is actually included, huh? 
It says nothing is included. Yeah, it, it's included if you install BusyBox, but since I don't have BusyBox installed, it doesn't have that command. Well, that makes me wonder, you know, if I install BusyBox in the emulator, you know, mm -hmm. I, then I should be able to use VI, right? So we'll look for BusyBox Android. And here we have it. And I, I need to download the file itself and then install it, you know, manually. So let's see, do we have a download link here? So this will install it directly onto my phone because I'm linking it to my. Try like a file zip or something. I don't know. I think you're going to find a download button to download the, the APK from there. Not from Play Store, but. No, not from Play Store. How about that? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so which one? This one? Okay, there we go. Well, since it's just the emulator, if it's you know hacked, you know it's not going to be a big deal. <laughs> you can register your account on your emulator. Yeah, True. Yep. Uh, the header that's in the XML file mm -hmm. is that the standard he header the way that it's set up? Mm, let me check. Let me check a few things. Okay, so it hasn't really downloaded the APK file yet. We started here. Should I click? Does it look suspicious to you? Yeah, this whole place is suspicious, so go for it. Or you pay. Or you pay. You can write it out. Just click it. I like pushing buttons. I like pushing buttons. I cannot be president of the United States. <laughs> okay. All right, so we'll, we'll give it a try. Why not? And where's my, okay, the other box. I keep losing track of all my uh, boxes. Ah. Okay, it has a pretty long name. It's Sturrickson Busybox. Okay. Install failed older SDK. Oh, okay, that's it's not installing. Ah, too bad. <clears throat> so I cannot really, you know, I don't, I cannot run an editor to change the file on the device. Yep. Do you have a root password for the Debian library? Um, it's a beer, so it's root beer. B e e r. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, security is not really that important because there's no, uh, there are no intrinsic server running inside the uh, the live distribution. Okay, but you know, at least I was able to show you guys where it's located, and you can actually copy files in using ADB, so that you can just use a file to overwrite that file entirely. Okay, so that's what you can do. All right, second thing. Okay, so getting back, I need to find out. Okay, where? There we, there we go. So cat tinydb1.xml. All right, so if I switch back to the app inside the emulator and I change something here, that this file should reflect that change. Okay, so we want to double check just to make sure that you know, it does hook up to the app here. So if I add a middle name, so let's say I add y as my middle name, and click store again, the file should be updated. So let me check the file again. Oops, um, the shortcut keys do not work, so that's why you see all the other ones. And you can see that now it does have Y as a middle name. If you put a space in, in a name, mm -hmm. that, show? that will be in the space. There will be a space between the quotes. Yeah, there will be. Okay. Yep. Yep. The header message I was asking about the XML version and all that is that typical? Oh, right, right, right. And then my main question was, what's standalone? I've never seen that. I do not know. I think standalone right. means it does not link to any known application. Okay. But that's just my guess. Okay? It's okay. just my guess that standalone means this XML file is not affiliated with any actual application. So it's not like um, it's not a um, 
a doc X, a part of a doc X, gotcha. you know, which is actually XML as well. <clears throat> All right. So now the biggest question is, what if the name is not uh, alphabetical, instead it's numeric, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna switch my name to something that is numerical and not uh, alphabetical. Okay. Uh, okay, that's what I wanna do. Okay, so I wanna say seven. <laughs> you guys know, you guys know where it's going, right? Of nine. There we go. So we have a you know, seven of nine as the name I store, and we want to see what is going to be actually stored in the name. I mean, inside the XML file. So the big question is: Is seven stored with single quotes around it, or not? That is the question. And I'm suspecting it does not have quotes. Okay. <laughs> so any numerical value is just the numerical value itself without quotes. No, nope, it is quoted. Okay, so I stand corrected. It is quoted. Because there was no logic being given by Athenventure saying that it's a new numerical. Is that right? But Possibly. No text box. It's, it's also coming from the text field of a text box, which automatically is a string. Yep. And the list itself, is it, uh, should be a string always, or can it be a list of? I think you can store numbers explicitly without the quotes. Mm, but how, hmm? how we can store numbers? Well, we can always inject it into the list, right? So let me switch back to App Inventor and just inject something. So I will make the list have one more item, and this is just <coughs> injected for testing purposes, right? So we go to math, and then we specify oh, yeah. a number, okay, just pick it. We'll just pick a 42, which is a very important number. Okay, I see some people knowing why it is important, and other people going like, what, 42? What about 42? 42, dolphins, they're all important. In the grand scheme of things. I thought it had something to do with 7 of 9. None of that has anything to do with 7 of 9, correct. Okay, so we say build, get the APK again. I have to reinstall it because I changed the code. Now, as the compiler is doing all kinds of stuff like this, let me ask you a question. A list is a container, just like a folder is a container in a file system. So the next question is, can we have a list inside a list? Can it nest? And the answer is yes, and then the next question is, how deep can you nest? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now that makes it very, very useful. Okay, so we'll we'll take a look at that once we are done with this part. Yep. So if you do a comparison with a string seven and a numeric seven, is it going to compare the ASCII value of the seven? It depends on which compare you use. Well, the map. The blue yeah, if you use the blue compare, it will compare the actual numerical value. It will con first convert the string, assuming it is a number, into the numerical value, and then it will do the compare. What if it's not? And then it will give you runtime error. Okay, so we are looking at camera one. So we'll upload it. It will overwrite the original app but not overwrite the TinyDB database. But inside the emulator, it will, take, it will exit from the app because you cannot update an app while it is running. So that's why we're out of the app. We have to go back into the app. And this time I can just, you know, just click store because I'm not even interested in the first three items. I'm only interested in the last item. And in the other text window, we can do the cat again. TinyDB1.xml. And 42 is not quoted. But how we can put 42? It's a, it's, a, it's a numerical value. Yeah, but uh, you, you did it uh, inside of your app. But how right. the you user instance? Yes. Yeah. How you Versus user? Well, <coughs> if there's no explicit conversion, you can always do stupid things to make it convert. 
<laughs> let me let me show you what. Okay, I am. Oh, I am. This kind of thing drives me. Okay, you know, how do we get it to do something that is not supposed to, or there's no way to do something that I wanted to be able to do? Then, but there are like some other ways. Okay, so one way to do it is add zero, because addition is a numerical operation. Adding a zero does not change the value, but it does force it to interpret the text as a numerical value and give you back a numerical value. Let's check. Let's see if that works. Right? So we'll go to math and then we can say, okay, let's use an addition here. And I'm just going to use one of the fields because I, there's no point in using all of them. Because this is really just a test. Can we force something to be a number when it is stored? That's basically what we are checking. <clears throat> okay, so this should be fine. We just have to make sure the first name can be interpreted as a number. So we build the app again. Okay, so getting back to uh, what I talked about a little bit earlier, that a list can contain other lists, like a, just like a folder can contain other folders, that is where it gets very, very useful, okay? Okay, so let me get the file back. It, nope, it hasn't asked me where to store yet. So it's still working, there we go. Okay, switch back to no, this one, but this one. And this is two. Go reinstall. Switch back to the emulator. Restart the app. And this time we'll try, uh, you know, seven of nine again. Okay. So we've got to skip a few things, you know, just because it's not important. And click store. And then go back to the other text. Uh, command line interface, look at db1.xml. So my guess is seven is now represented as a number without the quotes. Nine still has quotes around it, and then the last 42 obviously does not have quotes. And that exactly is the case. So exactly the way I predicted, so that's good. So you can force you know, the numerical representation in the file by using a numerical operation as the last operation. It is very cool. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So are there any other questions about this particular program at this point? No other questions? OK. Now, since I can store a list inside a list, and there's no real limitation as to <coughs> how long a list can be, or how deep you can nest inside a list, inside a list, inside another list. So that makes it very, very, very flexible. Because there are programming languages, entire programming languages, based on lists. And people go like, whoa, what? You know, is that a new programming language? You know, who made it? No, it's a really, really old programming language. I think it was invented in the 50s. It's called Lisp, L-I-S-P which stands for list processing, okay? So as a result, you know, list operations are very, very uh, useful. And I think Lisp actually originates from MIT, which is also where App Inventor originates from. <laughs> so there's no, there's, there's a particular reason why there's a link between, you know, the use of Lisp. Okay, are there any questions at this point about, you know, the concept of a list? Or at least how to put a list together and store it. Okay. Is there any way of encrypting this data so that it's stored a little bit more secure within DB tiny DB? <laughs> None that I know of. Okay. Just <laughs> curiosity. If you want to encrypt anything, my suggestion is to use a JavaScript to do it. You can. There, there are ways for you to integrate JavaScript into um, App Inventor. So inside App Inventor, you can invoke a JavaScript function to do encryption and whatnot. But for encryption to work, you need an encryption key, right? So you still have to specify the key somewhere. And that's going to be the issue is, you know, how do you specify the key? And the only way to make it secure is for the key to be entered by the end user and not stored anywhere. So this way, you know, people can get a hold of your phone, can look at all the files, but since the key to decrypt to decipher is not stored on the device, then you know 
if they have to they have to get the person to disclose the key in that case. Um, so that's the only way I can think of to do encryption. If, um, so you basically will still have TinyDB the way it is, except whatever is stored is encrypted, and you will have to decipher the encrypted uh, text inside TinyDB before you can utilize it in the app again. Yep. Um, would um, like Firebase or something like that be better if you wanted a little bit more security? The way Firebase is set up right now is not very secure. So this is that's a good question, you know, because many of you are probably thinking using Firebase for a few uh, reasons. So there are Firebase is cool. Okay, so let's go ahead and read the the operation. They might have changed certain aspects of it, but I don't think so. Okay, so it has certain properties, but you know, many of these are designated designer only which means you know you probably don't want to do it unless you know how it is utilized in the component itself. So without being able to change your developer bucket or your token, you know, then you're basically sharing the same database as everybody else. Now, it does make use of the name of your app and your identity as a part of the key to get to your part of the Firebase Thing, but it's not secure in any way. If other people know the name of your app, they can get your way. They, they can get their way into your the data of your app. So the only way to really store something securely and retrieve something securely is to uh, use your own website. For instance, you know, write your own web script on the server. So this way, you can store and retrieve your own things remotely, and make sure it's going through HTTPS you know, just to. Just to make sure. Is that making any sense? Okay, let, let me just draw a picture because I, I do want to kind of let those of you who want to pursue this at least, you know, and also the rest of the class, at least know what, is, what are the options and how that's going to work. Okay, so let me just go ahead and use a picture to do that part. Switch back to. There we go. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> so my suggestion, if you want to store something securely, but you want to use the App Inventor approach, is like this. Okay. So this is <clears throat> this is your App Inventor side on the mobile device, and going through the internet, and this is your server. Okay. Okay. So the first thing you want to do is to have some way to authenticate and establish you know, the concept of a session. Okay? So since, you, since people ask this question, I'm assuming you understand these concepts already. Okay? So you basically want to be able to, you know, the first part is to authenticate. Make sure you can sign in. So the remote server can give the local side a token or a, uh, a cookie to maintain the concept of a session. So once you authenticate, then you can you know, basically store or retrieve as needed. But everything here has to go through HTTPS so that you know, it's an end-to-end -end encryption. So no one in the middle can actually see what is going on. And then the author author authentication, the password, and the <coughs> username should never be stored on the device itself. And that's how you can you know, uh, u utilize an approach like this. So the data is actually stored remotely on the server. It's no longer local to the app itself. Is that working OK? All right. How many people know how to maintain a quote unquote session using cookies and stuff like that? Okay, just a general idea. OK, all right. Okay, so any other questions? No other questions? All right. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the app here because I have only shown you how to store something, but I haven't shown you guys how to retrieve something and break it back up into multiple pieces to stick into these text fields. So that's what I'm going to do next. So what I'll do next is to go back to the blocks here, 
And just change the code back a little bit because I don't need the 42 anymore. So I'm going to take out the 42 and change the list to only have three items instead of four because the fourth item is just for testing purposes. So I can get rid of that. And I'm also going to make sure that this is not going to be treated as a number because once again, that's only for testing to see if we can coerce App Inventor to store a number as a number and not as a string. And that was successful. Okay. So I have just reverted you know, everything that I did to this app back to the original. So I'm going to give myself another button called Restore. Okay. So one is called Store, the other one is just Restore. So this way we can you know, retrieve what is in TinyDB and put it back into the text window here. Okay. So we'll use another button to do this part. change the text of this button to retrieve <coughs> or read whatever however you want to call that okay so I'll just call it retrieve and then change the name of the button to reflect that there you go and now we switch back to the blocks and say okay but how do we retrieve items from the tiny DB and be able to you know restore the content into the text box so now we, it's object-oriented programming. It, everything starts with a click on the retrieve button. So we start with that. All right. But we have several concerns here. The first one is, what if this is the first time we run the app and there's nothing to retrieve? So we have to be prepared for that situation. So that means you know we have to attempt first. But if it doesn't work, then we have to handle it in a certain way. If it does work, then we we'll handle it in some other way. <coughs> Is that part okay? All right. So we have to start with a conditional statement to basically say, okay, there are two ways these things can happen. Maybe we already have something stored, maybe we don't, okay? So now the, the question is, how do we decide whether something is already stored and it, it, it can be used as a name, or either something has not been stored before or it cannot be used to retrieve something? So there, so there are th those two questions, okay? All right, so let's see how we can, what we can do with um, TinyDB to help us out a little bit here. So TinyDB itself gives us ways to, um, to check whether a tag exists or not, okay? So if, if we can use, we can either use get tags and see if the tag that we want is a part of it, or we can just say get value and then be very careful about value if tag not there. Okay, so we, we know this is important. We, we just take it out and say, okay, this is important. So now the next question is, we already know the tag name. The tag name is just name. So we'll duplicate and put it here. So, so the question is, what should we specify as a value if the tag is not in TinyDB1? Okay, that's the question. We can, there are several ways to proceed. You can make it a string, which is not a list, okay? So anything that is not a list is no good, okay? We cannot use it. You can make it a list that is empty, okay? Because if it's not a list with at least three items, I know it's not what I want, okay? So there are several ways to proceed at this point. And I can, I can probably combine all these things together but the one thing that I need to use is to store as a local variable. That has to be done separately. So this is one really good use of a local variable. So I'm gonna put a local variable block here and then put everything inside the local variable scope. So what this means, okay, I should change the name here. <clears throat> uh, I will just say this is retrieved item. Oops, that name too long. There we go. Okay. So I have a local variable that is called <coughs> retrieved item. And the name, the, the classification of local means that only within this orange block can I refer to retrieved item. The rest of the program does not even know this variable exists. Okay. Uh, there are some other things about local variables, you know, like the time, the lifespan that I'm not going to get into in this class, not yet. Okay, 
but for the for the purposes of scoping, which means you know, which uh, which blocks has visibility of retrieved items, it's only the blocks inside this orange block here. Nowhere else in the program can actually see this variable because it doesn't really matter to the rest of the program. And then I'll hook up this block over here. In other words, what I'm doing here is I am declaring a local variable called retrieved item. And what it is going to store is an attempt to ask for an item called name in TinyDB. If it fails, then it will just give me an empty string. If it's successful, it will give me whatever is stored in TinyDB1. Inside this block here, assuming that I got something, then I have to check, is that something that I need, that I can actually use as a name? What do you think I should check? I need to check the, the variable retrieved item, but what am I checking? It should be... Well, it may be blank if it is not already in TinyDB, but if it is in TinyDB already, it's going to, it's going to be giving me a what? How was it stored? Oh, a list. It was stored as a list, so when I retrieve it, it should also be retrieved as a list. So that's the first thing I need to check is whether I retrieved a list or not. Okay, if it's not a list, I don't even want to do anything with it. Okay, so I can go to lists and say, okay, can I even ask the question, is something a list? So you can see here, if you move down a little bit here, is a list, is a question. And I just have to say, okay, what thing do you want to check whether it's a list or not? Well, it's retrieved items. There we go. So now I have a way to say, okay, I won't even get to then if I did not retrieve a list. If I retrieve a string, I'll just do nothing with it. If I retrieve you know, a text, I won't do anything with it. By the time I get to, I get to then, it is guaranteed to be a list at least. Is that making any sense? So you can check the type of something before you do any processing with it. Because if I did not, and I just assume it's going to be a list, and it turns out not to be a list, it would give me runtime error, which is not really the best thing to happen. Yep? Okay, so if it, it was not created at all beforehand, mm -hmm. hit the retrieve, yep. it will not come back to list. Okay. It will come back as whatever value is specified as this thing, this thing here, value if tag not there. In this case, it's an empty string. You can make it a zero, just a numerical value zero, which is not the list. Anything other than the list is going to be okay. Yeah. Yep. And that's not actually storing anything in the database in that case, right? Value is not there. It is not storing anything. It because this thing always comes back with a value, even if there's nothing stored in TinyDB. So this gives you an option to specify an exception case of, okay, if I did not find anything in TinyDB1, how would you want me to report that? That's basically what it's asking. So you have to specify something that is either the default, if it is not already stored, or you have to specify something that's not going to happen. It's very unlikely to be stored if it is not in the database. All right, so we're going to stop here with this here. Um, we'll move on to the lab. If you guys want to talk about the project, because the project proposal was due earlier today, so if you want me to go over that with you, you know, during the lab time, that's great. You know, it's a good use of our time. If not, you know, I'll see you guys on next Monday. Uh, there's no outstanding homework assignment just yet because I haven't finished with the concept of a list. Okay. Project proposal. That was due today, yeah. earlier? Yeah. Did you pass out the assignment sheet today? No, I did not. I forgot again. Okay. Well, <laughs> I forgot to wake up this morning. So oh, one of those days. Yep.